good evening uh, welcome to this fifth uh, webinar of IST it is my indeed a uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. K. Rajiv. Dr. K. Rajiv obtained his PhD degree in physics from Kerala University. He also had uh, undergone WMO class one metallurgist training and he was postdoctoral research physicist at uh, Scripps Institute, Institution of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego, USA. Currently, currently he is a <coughs> heading the microwave and boundary layer physics branch, atmospheric technology division, and planning and coordination shape of uh, SPL VSSC. He is the principal scientist of the national uh, IGPP Nobel project. He is the Indian representative to POSPER and member of the research advisory committee of the Indian uh, Institute of uh, Geomagnetism, Mumbai, and also uh, Indian Institute of Tropical Metrology Pune. Area of his research includes atmospheric physics, aerosols, clouds, radiation, atmospheric remote sensing. He has published 70 research paper in uh, peer-reviewed journals and four research scholars obtained PhD under his supervision. ISRO and NASA Earth Observatory release, released news items on his findings on aerosols, clouds, and radiative impact. So, sir, I uh, invite you to uh, deliver your webinar and hand over to you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sinha. Uh, uh, we will uh, proceed uh, with the uh, lecture. Uh, see, I have a uh, lot of slides with me, OK? And I don't want to spend a run through all of them. Hmm? In case uh, you have any trouble, you can uh, ask me either, because usually there's a complaint that I go fast. But when I go fast, I assume that, you know, I mean, students will be aware of. But then whenever you want to stop me, you can stop me and ask, okay? While stopping, because I'm in full screen, I will not be able to see you raising the hand and all. So you can uh, ask, you can switch on your mic and ask. Okay, so I will talk about tropical clouds today. Um, uh, and I will also come to some of the interesting or very interesting aspects that we have found or others also have found on the Indian summer monsoon, uh, cloudiness, and the associated changes in dynamics. Okay. You know, why should we study clouds? Hmm? Clouds are the largest modulators of the uh, energy budget of the earth atmosphere system. The largest modulators of the energy budget of the earth atmosphere system. When I say energy budget, solar radiation, its interaction, latent heating, you, you put all those things, radiative forcing, a radiative impact, as well as the energetics through mechanical processes, means uh, energy transfer through mechanical processes, including latent heating and uh, sensible heating. Clouds are the largest modulators. They play a pivotal role in the transfer of energy, redistribution of energy from one place to another, both horizontally and vertically in the atmosphere. So that lead to vertical coupling of the atmosphere. They regulate the surface temperature, atmospheric thermodynamics, and circulation. They modulate the effect of aerosols and their residence time. They are cleansing agents, so they change the chemistry of the atmosphere. Obviously, they have a huge role in the hydrological cycle and weather. And let me tell you, the biggest, one of the major sources of uncertainty in the weather and climate prediction is due to the complex cloud feedback processes, which comes through cloud parameterization is one thing. That is direct, but then the feedback, which is, which is one of the least understood uh, features in the atmospheric science, is, 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 is a very, very important aspect, okay? Any change in cloud type at one location or its water content or altitude will have substantial impact on the atmospheric conditions, including whether it is warming or cooling the atmosphere or the surface, and potentially affect other species, including aerosols. This I, I, I kept just as a quick uh, reference to you. You know, water is the fuel for atmospheric dynamics. Because water is the fuel for atmospheric dynamics because surface is getting heated up by the uh, solar radiation coming in. Temperature increases, evaporation takes place, latent heat evaporation is taken up, goes to the atmosphere, 
So there's a lot of energy, and this drives in turn the dynamics. We will come to that in a short time. What is more important for that is water can exist in all three phases. That is very very important for the sustenance of life on Earth as well as the redistribution of energy within the ecosystem system. And uh, uh, actually, what is more important is the largest greenhouse effect that is greater than 50% of the total greenhouse effect is coming from water vapor. Water, I will say, not water vapor, water, which includes clouds also. But it has a feedback effect through carbon dioxide. It will amplify the effect of carbon dioxide. It is not just water vapor alone. You see, uh, you know, the greenhouse effect doesn't add up linearly, like carbon dioxide this much, water vapor this much. The effect of carbon dioxide depends on water vapor. And the effect of water vapor depends on carbon dioxide. It's a coupled system because both are in, both change the availability of long-wave radiation, which can be absorbed. What is uh, important from the uh, you know mechanical point of view, that is uh, you know convection and things like that. Specific latent heat of fusion is 334 for water, and specific latent heat of vaporization is 2258 kilojoule per kilogram. Okay, it means huge amount of energy is stored when you evaporate one kilogram of a, or condenses it, it releases the other way compared to fusion but this you have to keep in mind when you are considering clouds and cloud transformations hmm? there's a freaking nature of water in the atmosphere it can uh, exist in all three phases i told but then what is more important is liquid water can exist even below zero degrees centigrade super cold water which you know very well that cumulonimbus cloud aircraft will not enter aircraft will be avoiding cumulonimbus cloud because one, super cold water can exist. Two, of course, cumulonimbus cloud is largely convective, so it can toss the uh, effect. Okay. Explosive condensation of super cold water twice takes place if, if, a, if a body enters into that, like aircraft, and it will not be able to move further. And uh, they are most abundant, but most variable trace constituent in the atmosphere is water or water vapor. You go to Arabia, water vapor may be very less. You come to India or the tropical region, okay, I mean, it will be very high. But again, there is highly non-uniformly distributed. And it varies in time, it hugely varies in time. It amplifies the effect of greenhouse uh, species and the largest contributor to the feedback and processing. I mean, uh, you know, feedback processes and the largest source of uncertainty. You know, if the clouds are low-level clouds, their radiative, longer radiative impact is very less because they are very close to the surface. You know, any body emits at sigma T44. Total energy emitted is sigma T44 per unit area. T is the temperature. You know very well. Now, the amount of radiation that is emitted will depend on the temperature. So, if you have a high altitude cloud, for example, cirrus clouds, they are at very high altitude. The temperature will be very low, like of the order of maybe 200, 200 Kelvin or maybe 220 Kelvin. They, uh, actually, uh, uh, I mean, release or, or radiate the energy. I mean, I mean, very low energy only is getting radiated because sigma T44. But then they absorb the radiation that was emitted by the Earth at 300 Kelvin, or maybe. So there is a huge trapping of air. In contrast, if you have low altitude cloud, they are very close to the Earth's surface. So, I mean, that's temperature 300, that, that temperature may be 290. The result is the amount of, uh, you know, long wave effect is very less. In contrast, the short wave, normally low level clouds are highly reflective clouds, whereas the high level clouds, especially uh, thin cirrus clouds are, you know, transparent, more or less. That's why they are called thin semi-transparent clouds. So, they will have huge long wave effect, yes, but then very little short wave effect. The net effect is low level clouds will cause a cooling effect whereas high-level clouds will have a warming effect. This you have to keep in mind because cirrus clouds has large long-wave heating potential. Or the average heating potential of the Earth is very high when you have cirrus clouds. When you have low-level clouds, it has a net cooling effect. So if contrails are increasing, for example, due to aircraft, it will have a net warming effect at the surface, which is very important, like in I mean, global uh, climate change and aspects change. Uh, you know, you just assume that the cloud is vertically growing. Okay, what is plotted here is cloud top pressure, which is altitude. Rightmost is thousand, which is surface. Leftmost is four hundred, which is close to around six and six kilometer. Y-axis is the top of atmosphere long wave flux that is emitted by the cloud. You see, when the cloud is growing, it is vertically growing. 
initially it's a longer flux that is going out will be of the order of 270 260 i mean what per meter square okay but as it grows maybe crossing 500 5 kilometer that is 500 hectopascal it becomes around 200 or maybe 210 watt per meter square what does it mean it traps close to around 70 watt per meter square as it grows which is quite high it is quite high and it will have huge replications in the uh, dynamics of the atmosphere that we will come to you look at another fashion this is a very famous ipcc uh, thing you know the radiative effect of uh, radiative forcing by different components i am not going into uh, the details of that i'm just only highlighting this portion which i have put in pink see there are two uh, aerosols will have aerosols if you look, if you look at they will have a cooling effect net cooling effect of course if it is absorbing it is different that we, we are not going to discuss direct effect of aerosol is very answer i mean i mean uh, you know how much uh, uncertainty is quite low okay you know that, that uncertainty bar is quite low Whereas indirect effect of aerosols through the cloud albedo effect, the uncertainty is huge. That comes because of the, I, I told you already, the kind of uncertainty is arising from the cloud. So you need to understand the clouds better to improve even our climate force method. All right. Uh, this graph, I, I want to spend one or two minutes on that. Hmm? Uh, this is actually the global mean uh, radiation budget of the Earth atmosphere system. I mean global mean. Okay, which means here, day, night, seasons, everything put together, this is a number and this is a point source. If you assume that 100 what 100 unit of solar radiation is coming, I have normalized everything for 100. And this is a picture which I take took from Schrenberg et al, which is one of the most famous figures in atmospheric energetics. Okay, so if 100 watt per meter square is coming, 100 watt per I mean, not 100 watt per meter square, I beg your pardon, 100 unit. I put. Because 100 watt per meter square is equivalent to 341 global mean watt per meter square. It is very difficult to compute in terms of 341, 100 and 239. It's very difficult. Let us assume it is 100 unit. If 100 unit is coming down, 30 unit is reflected back approximately. That is called a albedo. Of the 30 unit that is reflected back, 23 unit goes from the atmosphere and 7 unit is contributed by the surface. Of the 23 unit that is going back to space, from the atmosphere, 17 unit come from the clouds. So you know what is the impact of clouds. So 100 unit of solar radiation coming, 17 unit of clouds is getting reflected back. 17 unit of radiation is getting reflected back by clouds. It's very high. But you wait a minute, let us see the longer effect. If you look at the right side, 70 unit of terrestrial radiation is going in. So if you take the radiation balance of the Earth's atmosphere, 100 has come in, 30 has gone in the short wave, and 70 has gone in the long wave. Long wave means earth emitted radiation. Okay. So balanced at the top atmosphere, perfectly okay. 30 plus 70, 100, fine. But you look at within the atmosphere. Within the atmosphere, uh, you know what is reaching in the short wave is only 47. Reaching means absorbing at the surface is only 47 in the short wave, that is from the sun. But earth emits 116 units of long wave. How? Because of the greenhouse effect. Because what is emitted by the earth, 116 is emitted, of that 104 is absorbed and 98 is coming back and uh, 58 is going back to space. So you see, most of the energy that has been released by the earth, radiative energy, has been absorbed by the atmosphere and come back. That is 116 emitted, 104 absorbed by the atmosphere and 98 came back. Now look at the numbers. Of this 98 unit that has come back, 60 unit has come from the clouds, only 32 unit from the atmosphere. And also, of the 58 unit which was directly going, 36 unit has come from the clouds. Okay, this 58 unit is emitted by the Earth atmosphere. There is another 12 unit that will be directly going with, right, without interacting from the surface itself. It will go directly without, without interacting with the atmosphere. So, net 70. Okay, so this is a number which I want you to understand. Short wave, there is 17 percent reflectivity coming from the clouds globally, which reduces the amount of radiation that reaches the surface in the solar domain. There is around 66 units of radiation long wave that is coming back through clouds. Of the 98 that is coming back, 66 from the clouds. And of the 58 that is going back to space through the atmosphere, from the atmosphere, 36 from the clouds. This shows the impact of clouds. Okay. This graph also shows something in that pink thing. Just look at that. 
if i add up all the numbers which is absorbed by the atmosphere i'm not going into the details you can believe me the numbers i will find that there is a deficit of radiation that is 29 units and in the surface there is an excess of i mean radiation if i sum up the absorbed short wave and long wave which is 29 that means surface has a net radiation heating of 29 units and atmosphere has lost 29 continuously which is not possible if atmosphere is keep on losing 29 surface is getting uh, keep on getting heated 29 surface would have been getting heated up temperature would have been increasing tremendously which doesn't happen so what happens what is happening is it is transferred to the atmosphere through mechanical processes that is the latent heat of evaporation is taken from the surface dumped in the atmosphere through again through clouds so that 24 unit is transferred again through clouds okay so you see the kind of impact that the cloud has whereas nine unit is through sensible heat flux for the sake of completeness this picture shows you that clouds are tremendously important now you look at the thing tropical clouds are very deep whereas higher latitude clouds are shallow and not shallow but at lower altitude so the impact of tropical clouds is completely different from what you have for the higher latitudes we will come in a, in, a, in a moment okay this figure i am not going to uh, discuss much because you already know uh, this is what i told you there is uh, an energy that is absorbed at the surface and energy that is going from the uh, back to space if you look at these two uh, the, the blue is in the short wave that is absorbed short i mean uh, solar radiation and the red is terrestrial radiation emitted you'll find that there is an excess that excess is actually in the tropical region and there is a deficit in the higher latitudes so now this energy will be transferred horizontally again through the water cycle either through the ocean or through the atmosphere through the cloud formation which derives the three, three self circulation model we will not go into the details that is okay but we why i graph, showed this graph is we do expect large amount of clouds in the tropics which is deep we don't expect much clouds in the subtropical belt where you have the descending motion of the hardly cell and we again expect high amount of clouds in the uh, polar uh, uh, subpolar region where you have another ascending motion of the associated with the polar cell and again in the high, i mean polar latitudes you have the descending movement and the low amount of clouds we have to see when you are keep this picture in mind when we are going to see the vertical distribution of clouds what is more important this is a classical picture you know in the equatorial region it rises and then sinks in the 30 degree latitude and then you know again the air that is coming from the polar region rises at 30 degree and then there is a trapped cell between you know the hardly cell parallel i mean polar cell which is called parallel cell fine but is it homogeneous absolutely no you look at the equatorial region the cloudiness is not uniform this cloud this graph you know very well you know over the, the the deepest clouds over the entire globe i will not say deepest the deep cloud deepest convection largest amount of convection over the entire globe is if you take the equatorial region occurs in the western pacific and east equatorial indian ocean okay and then comes over the uh, atlantic and the american uh, region okay and uh, another thing comes in the african region so you have three cells which are associated with the walker cell so cloudiness will be largest in the, these three cells among them the largest will be the pacific circulation walker circulation we have to see all these things as we proceed when we are seeing the clouds okay and this is what it is the clouds are uh, you know you know visible in your dynamics of the atmosphere you can see lot of things you can see even cyclones you know like going like uh, you know um, uh, these uh, tops you can see just just like that so this is the global uh, you know this is obtained by stitching uh, the water vapor images obtained in satellite images okay. this gives the exact information what we were talking in the equatorial region you have large amount of clouds but then it is not uniform it is occurring dissipating so huge dynamics is involved but generally the cloud amount is largest in the equatorial region least in the subtropical region because of the descending cell of the hartley cell the result is you have uh, you know all the deserts are located in that area then in the uh, subpolar region you have again another high and in the polar region you have very weak that uh, uh, summarizes this picture summarizes the whole thing what we are talking in the equatorial region you are the tropical region you have the deepest clouds okay and the polar region you have the low altitude clouds means correspondingly there will be a change in the long wave radiative effect of clouds and hence the uh, impact of clouds on atmospheric energetics okay so uh, this is what it is this is the actual observations of cloud distribution over the entire globe the left 
top left is from the uh, MODIS data, which you already know, MODIS are like. What I want you to show here is the red indicates, actually the, the color map there in, in the top graph indicate what is the frequency of occurrence of cloud. Means if you have, if you take, uh, uh, you know, um, 30 days of data, how many days you have clouds? So, uh, I mean, you know, 30, 30, I mean, 100 percent means all 30 days will be cloudy. Okay. But almost in no place there will be 100 percent. But you can see India, East Central Indian Ocean, Western Pacific. That's what we are telling by Walker circulation. The largest amount of clouds occur over there in the Equatorial region. And then you have the, uh, you know, the Brazilian region and the, uh, I mean, you know, this uh, South American region. And also you have the African region. That is the third uh, region. But in addition to that, you have the belt, equatorial belt, that is ITCC, going around the globe. You have the large amount of cloudiness. And then in the uh, in the slightly higher latitudes, that is subpolar region, you have very low amount of clouds. But again, non-uniform, highly non-uniform. Okay. Then again, in the polar region, you have large amount of clouds. The top right graph shows what is the actual amount of clouds distributed vertically in a global mean sense. X-axis is the latitude, Y-axis is height. So if you average, you can see that the frequency of occurrence of clouds, you know, in the vertical uh, direction, they reach up to around 16 or 17 kilometers in the equatorial region or tropical region, whereas they are very uh, low, maybe of the order of eight or nine kilometers in the polar regions. Okay. In fact, not in the polar region. Actually, polar region will be still lower slightly. This is only up to 60 degree or 65 degree. Okay. So you have a systematic reduction. And you also see the region where the sinking occurs, that is subsidence associated with the hardly cell. You can clearly see here at around 30 degree, you see with low amount of clouds. So you have in the global mean, here you have huge ascending of clouds, ascending of air and then associated with the cloud formation. I mean, associated with that you have the cloud formation. And let me also tell you the largest amount of clouds over the tropical region doesn't occur in the surface or I mean in the lower altitudes, but it occurs at around 15, 16, 17 kilometer. But typically here you, you may find it at 15 kilometer, but that varies with uh, season and all those things. That's fine. And they are mostly what? Cirrus clouds. They are mostly cirrus clouds. They won't be precipitating. That's what is shown in the bottom graph. The bottom graph shows the precipitation occurrence. You see in the equatorial region, precipitation can be there as deep as 15 kilometer. But you see the maximum precipitation is not there. Maximum precipitation, precipitating clouds occur below around around six or seven kilometer in the equatorial region. And in the higher latitude, if you go, say, 60 degrees south, you see, you have huge amount of low altitude clouds precipitating. Of course, the frequency of occurrence of cloud also is quite high there. That's what this green in the north I mean, top graph shows. So what I want to impress upon you from this graph is cloud occurrence doesn't reflect directly on the precipitation. There is a completely different degree of agreement between cloud occurrence and precipitation because the cloud top that is occurring, cloud type that is occurring there is mostly service. They have huge impact on the atmospheric energetics, huge impact, which is of active area of research. Okay. Now you talk, come to the top, I mean, bottom left. What it is done is apportionment of this cloud in terms of liquid water and ice water. You can see that there is large amount of ice water in the equatorial region. Of course, it is also there in the higher latitudes of the order of 50 to 60. Okay. So this is what the total cloud physics in an integrated manner is. Spatial distribution of clouds and average. I'm, I'm talking about multi-year average. That is 2006 to 2011. Average, seasonal average, diurnal average, everything done. And how is it vertically distributed? If you want to take a snapshot, that is a global picture. What happens to the precipitation? How does it look? look? And in precipitation also, is it ice water path or liquid water path? Okay, completed. Now, you see how observations differ from the models. You know, Forbes et al. 2019, he submitted a report to ESA. I took it from there. Comparison of observation with models. The top one shows the cloud sap product. Okay. The middle one and the, I mean, shows the, the cloud mask again, very similar to this. And the bottom one shows the model data. So a typical example, left is for January, right is for July. So January 2007, July 2007. This is an example. You can see that there's a complete disagreement between what is observed and what is modeled. What does it mean? It means the model will never be able to, at least as of now, and this scenario did not change even now today, okay? This scenario did not change even today. 
much. There are improvements, but they did not change even today. So there's a substantial difference between the clouds that are observed and model. What does it mean? Is it, does it mean that okay, chalega? No. Actually, in model, when you have clouds occurring or not occurring, the redistribution of energy will be completely different in the model compared to observation which means the dynamics the model is producing need not be necessarily exactly correct compared to what you are observing. That is why the models are always initiated, you know, with the current scenario and then run for a short duration where they may be producing reasonably good results, but notwithstanding that, not in terms of clouds or precipitation. This is one of the reasons why, you know, the models are not able to produce precipitation much. Okay, now I'm not a modeler, so you can ask these questions much to the modelers, what is happening to the model and how it is done. But you take it from me that observations and models do not go exactly hand in hand, uh, you know, between uh, the model and the observations. At the same time, let me also tell you another thing. Grossly, they do agree. They do agree grossly. For example, the, uh, the, 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 the amount of clouds that are occurring in the tropical region is always uh, reproduced in, uh, in the model and observations. The descending a limb of hardly cell and the least amount of clouds well reproduced. The subtropical, uh, the subpolar region uh, amount of cloud increase very high, both in model and observation. But they, they are not agreeing in quantitative terms. Qualitatively, they do agree and they are very good, but not quantitatively. This is a problem when you are actually trying to I mean, reproduce either clouds and precipitation. Okay, so you'll have a precipitation impact also. That is why models will not be able to exactly produce the precipitation. There will be other problems also that you can ask the modelers. Okay, but then this shows why should you study clouds and still why studying clouds is very important. Okay, this is a, a thing which um, I will not spend much time. This is okay because uh, I have to go a little bit faster. I mean, we cannot cover up everything. Okay, how clouds are formed. This you know, I am only naming for the naming sake. I am not going much into the details. Clouds are formed by convection. Clouds can be formed by advection. Clouds can be formed by radiative cooling, for example, fog. Okay, supersaturation, the advection of air mass. Then you have the effect of aerosols on all these processes. The basic process is condensation and growth of cloud droplets. You have the aerosols or cloud condensation nuclei. Water vapor condenses on that. Again, it depends on what is the kind of, uh, you know, uh, the condensation nuclear property. I'm not going to the microphysics of cloud, which is another totally uh, interesting area. I'm interested in that also, but at the same time, we don't have time much to go in that direction. Then we will not be able to complete. Okay. This is another uh, completely different area, but it is very interesting. There the aerosol cloud interaction comes. Okay. Let me also tell you the cloud, the droplet cannot simply grow like that. The growth of the droplet will be initially rapid, but then it will be very slow. Uh, the droplet may be growing to maybe 5 micron, 10 micron, 20 micron. It cannot grow beyond. And a 10, 20 micron droplet cannot precipitate down because air uh, drag is very high. But if they collide, they can coil. So atmospheric turbulence comes into play here. So through the atmospheric movements, like atmospheric turbulence or uh, random movements, uh, you know, Brownian movement, uh, you can if you want. If you want to have an analogy, but exactly it is not Brownian movement. You have the turbulence and things like that, convection, eddies. They will be, there's a possibility that they will collide. Once they collide, there's a possibility that they will coil. So that means the droplet will become bigger. So the nutshell is initial growth of the droplet is through cloud condensation. Further sir, growth is through collision coil. Yeah, sir, please. Sir, your slide is not uh, moving, sir. You are still in cloud formation process or? Because... Yeah, yeah, I'm still in cloud formation okay. process. I was just trying to list it. Okay. I'm moving now. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the major changes in cloud observations, the major changes in challenges in cloud observation is, you know, the horizontal uh, scale of the clouds are, it can range from few tens of meters to few hundreds of kilometers. Okay, so there is, you know, satellite have a minimum pixel size. So the clouds which are sub pixel level clouds, either they will take it as 100% cloudy because you cannot have a discerning of sub pixel level clouds. Though I told you, those who are interested in research, there is a technique which is called a spatial coherence which can determine what is the sub-pixel level clouds. But then it's a very involved process and it's a very, very time consuming. Uh, that anyway, that is a research topic. Okay. Uh, the second thing is the physical thickness arises from few tens to few hundred, a few tens, I mean, few, few, few meters to few tens of uh, meters, few, few tens of kilometers. For example, thin surface clouds, 250 meter, 100 meter. 
thick convective clouds, CB clouds, can be of the order of 15 kilometer or more even. Huge variation in opacity, that is another effect. Because some clouds can be very, very thin, like thin cirrus cloud, we call subvisual cirrus. Uh, you will not be even able to see some of them with the naked eye. You may require a LiDAR for that purpose. But they will have significant radiative impact. Or the opacity can be more than 100. For, for example, cumulonimbus cloud or convective clouds, numbers clouds, things like that. That means no single technique can cover the entire range of transmitters. You cannot have a single technique to determine all these type of clouds. Okay. Considerable horizontal homogeneity exists. And considerable changes in vertical structure exist. Combined with these two things, what I'm trying to tell is I took a snapshot of clouds and then I'm studying it. Of course, it is not correct. The reason being just in 15 minutes, clouds will change. Okay. So you need to have a constant sampling, which is possible with infrared, but it is not possible with cloud data that we will come to the vertical profile. It's really challenging. Essential properties that uh, we monitor with the clouds, you know, occurrence of cloud, obviously. Cloud top temperature, which will give you the cloud altitude in a passive radiometer. Cloud liquid water content, we can have cloud optical depth, cloud albedo. Droplet size distribution also you can have if you observe in multiple wavelengths, okay. Then broadband short wave and longer radiative fluxes, which will tell you how much is the radiative impact of clouds. And the altitude profiles that are required is liquid water content, the cloud water content, and droplet size distribution. If you have all these things, what you can derive? You can derive the spatial variation of cloud types, altitude profile of cloud occurrence, altitude profiles of cloud latent heating, altitude profiles of radiative fluxes and cloud radiative forcing. Ideally, I want to have a sampling of the order of 15 minutes. That is what Insight is doing. Two Insights together, or Insight 3D and Insight 3D R, or Insight other Insight series. Together, you can actually observe clouds in 15 minutes. Okay, but then it is only imageries. It can, I mean, you know, only the top of the cloud is not the interiors because the technique is passive reading. So how do you detect clouds? Again, I'm quickly going through. You have the passive technique. Passive technique means you are not sending anything, you are only receiving. Okay, like I am seeing the, you are seeing the slide is a passive technique. You are not sending something, you are only uh, receiving what, what is, the, the, I mean, coming out of your computer or, uh, you know, your, your laptop. Okay. There's another technique called active. Active means I am sending a radiation, for example, radar beam or laser radio wave or laser. Now, what happens? It gets scattered from the radio, I mean, the, the radio waves or uh, laser uh, that is light, gets scattered and then you will be able to detect it back. This is called active remote sensing. So satellite remote sensing you can classify into two, passive and active. Usually inside 3D and things like that does passive remote sensing. They are not active. There are active remote sensing, for example, space one radar, space one radar. It's, uh, you, you might be aware of cloud set and calypso. We'll come in one minute. They are active remote sensing. Okay. Uh, the uh, ground-based remote sensing also is there for the sake of completeness. You have the microwave images, micro profilers. Actively, again, you have radars and radars in the uh, ground. And there is another thing that is in-situ sampling. For example, you can take an, uh, you know, you, you, you go to, for example, you have a Ponwudi station. ISTA has a Ponwudi station. You can have the droplet size distribution. You can have the microphysics of clouds which are coming there. You, the cloud will come to your lab. Okay. The second is you can take an aircraft and then go and have the sampling. The advantage is this is very accurate, very fine resolution. And there are certain parameters which can never be done with satellite, can be done with in situ. Okay. Again, this is only for your information. Uh, uh, I, I will skip the uh, area on the detection technique uh, of clouds based on satellite data due to lack of time. Uh, if somebody is interested at the end, we can discuss that. Okay. I'm only telling that this is a passive radiometer, the inset. You have the picture, what is shown on the left side is, uh, is the thermal infrared, and on the right side is water vapor band. Actually, there are different spectral bands over which you will be able to observe, and then you will be able to obtain different types of cloud also. Okay. For example, in the right side, you'll be able to get even thin surface clouds, and we developed a technique to derive the thin surface clouds from these kind of data by using a bispectral algorithm, okay? And look at the visible. See, visible, there's a problem. During the nighttime, you cannot have, for example, this is a picture that is for the early morning in India. You are not able to get anything over Africa because solar radiation did not reach there. Over the Japanese area, it is known now. So what this picture shows is, while the infrared technique is usable 24 by seven, this is not possible. Because this is, uh, I mean, the visible technique is useful only for the day, okay? 
This is a technique that we have used to derive cirrus clouds from the uh, water vapor channel and infrared. We will not go into the details, but satellite has a lot of I mean, you know, possibilities. That is, that is what I wanted to tell you. Uh, evolution of satellite observation also I will skip because let us go to more to the physics because this is a little bit history. Hmm? But uh, let me tell you one thing. One satellite that has done over the years and again and again for decades is NOAA OS, that is Polar Orbiting Environmental Satellites, which is sun synchronous satellite, which made observations for over 40 years now. So if you want to have the satellite observations, it exists for over 40 years with a very sim same similar type of uh, payloads. Satellites were getting repeated, but the payload was similar. I'm not saying same, it was similar. There were some advancements and all those things, but the original channels, they are still retained. That's the beauty of that. But of course, I mean, you they go around the, go around the globe, they are sun synchronous, so you will not get that diurnal variation at fixed time of the day, like two passes kind of thing only you'll have. In contrast, the geostation satellites, you have the INSAT series, like that you have other parts of the globe, you have GOES, you have FOI, you have uh, Himavari, you have Meteosat, so many things are there, okay? So those things, but then they will give you continuously at a particular place, they cannot cover the whole globe, okay? Uh, then you have the much advancement in cloud observations from MODIS and AIRS, that is the ARS. There are multi spectral observations where they are and sounders there, there. And for radiation budget, you have ARB and series. Now we have the mechatropic satellite, which is already up, and I'll come to that in a moment. And the real milestone was, of course, I, I'm telling you now, TRMM, that was a tropical rainfall monitoring mission, which was the first space one radar which was for the space one altitude profiling of precipitation. And Megatropics, if you look at, which is a satellite dedicated, it is an Indo-French mission, is one of the best satellites over the tropics. It is low inclination satellite, means you can have multiple observations in a single day by the same satellite, otherwise it is not possible. And over the whole tropics it will cover. You have several payloads in that. Two beautiful payloads there is Saphir and Scarab. There's one Madras, but then that was not highly successful. There was some, uh, some problem. Saphir will provide you the altitude profiles of water vapor. Scarab will give you the radiative fluxes. We have, we have used it, we'll come to that in a moment. And there is, uh, you know, there's a project, I should mention that, ISCCP, that is Confluencive Satellite Analysis. It's called International Satellite Cloud Climatology Project. They combine the satellite data from all sources available and produce a product which researchers can use so that you don't have to scratch your head on what is the technique to be used there, what is the technique to be used here, and harmonization of different uh, techniques, harmonization of different, uh, you know, instruments, uh, you know, instrumental uncertainties, all these things will be harmonized and then you'll get this into uh, data set. It's a good data set. And of course, then came, you know, no single satellite can do the whole thing, so a beautiful concept came, a train constellation of satellites. That A train means afternoon train, okay? So 1.30 is pass. You have the CloudSat following Kylepso, following Aqua. So you have a series of satellites going. And then these days you have the GPM mission that is for precipitation. This again I will skip because you already are aware of all these things. This is Mechatropics. This is the orbit that is covered by Mechatropics. It doesn't cover the whole globe. It covers the tropics completely. You can get even, uh, you know, as much as three to seven passes per day. So it has a precision cycle. The orbit has a precision cycle of 51 days. Means in 51 days, all parts of the globe can be observed at all local times. That's what it means. So you can have a diurnal evolution if you combine 51 days of data. But then that will be only seasonal mean, but that's fine. When you don't have any other thing over the entire globe. Okay. Uh, the Saphir, it is, uh, no, this is Madras. Uh, sorry, this is Madras. It did not uh, work well. We will not go much into the details. Saphir, it is it is still providing the altitude profiles of uh, humidity in the atmosphere and this is one of the most successful satellites that was ever launched and it is part of GPM mission now it's a much sought after mission okay Mechatropics uh, has uh, you know SCARA the that is a radiation budget I think you have the short verb and long verb you can actually derive the short verb radiative forcing and long verb radiative forcing from the real breakthrough in satellite remote sensing so far, uh, what, what, whatever thing we were discussing was passive. So you will not be able to get anything to the in inside. The real breakthrough came through CloudSat and Calypso, which, which, which is a, CloudSat is a space one radar, Calypso is a space one lidar. So uh, space one lidar means laser, uh, space one radar means radar. I'll come to that in a moment. So this is what A train is. 
So A3 means one after the other. The same place, same orbital track within of the order of four minutes, okay, is covered by a series of satellites from, you know, uh, Aura to Glory to Parasol to Calypso to CloudSat to Aqua. So it's a series of satellites. Some of them failed uh, subsequently. That's okay. We will not go into those details. But then Calypso, CloudSat, Aqua, um, Aura, all those things, uh, you know, they, they observe the same part of the Earth in multiple spectral domains with multiple techniques so that a whole gamut of the game is, is understandable. And there the cloud set is, it contains a cloud profiling radar, its frequency is 94 gigahertz. Those of you who are engineers among you will be better understanding this. That means the wavelength is of the order of T millimeter. What does it mean to you is cloud droplet size will be of the order of say 10 to 100 micrometer. This is of the order of three millimeter which means you have Rayleigh scattering that is coming from there. What does it mean is very thin cirrus clouds or thin clouds will not be detectable by that because it is Rayleigh domain, okay? But thick clouds, it will be able to penetrate through thick clouds. That's the advantage of this uh, radar, okay? It will penetrate through thick clouds and you'll be able to get a complete vertical profile along the subsatellite track. It is not scanning. It is just observing along the subsatellite track, like a vertical curtain, okay? okay. Calypso? It contains a LIDAR. So LIDAR cannot penetrate through optically thick medium, you know very well. So you will not be able to get a vertical profiling of thick clouds. But unlike the radar, its, it's wavelength is 532 nanometer. So it will be able to interact with even optically thin uh, atmosphere, I mean clouds. So it will be able to detect cirrus clouds as well as aerosols. So cirrus clouds, our, our, our interest here is cirrus clouds, okay? So it will be able to detect cirrus clouds. By combining these two things, you will be able to get a totality of the picture. This is an example. You have the uh, orbit, and then the top is the cloud mask that is obtained from the radar. Uh, this is only for the radar, okay? So you'll be able to get a vertical cross-section of the thing. But the disadvantage is this orbit. Now the next orbit comes after 100 minutes. By that time, Earth will be rotating by around 25 degrees. So you'll be able to get the next pass only beyond 25 degrees from now. Next pass today. But if you grid all those data, it has a 16-day repeatability, you will be able to get grids of 1.6 degree uh, width, okay? Uh, so you'll be able to cover. But then, uh, let me tell you, this cannot cover the, I mean, everything in a single day, the globe. It can be covered over the 16-day repeatability cycle. Still, there will be small gaps. But then, the information that it provides is unprecedented in the history that this is the first time that you'll be able to cut through and it produced a discovery class results, whichever thing which I told you also, I'm coming to that. And there are various techniques to be followed. Uh, why I'm telling these things is you should get an impression. You should not think that, no, no, there is a visual patch and that is a cloud. Okay, it is not so. It is difficult to detect cloud, especially when it is thin surface cloud or even thinner cloud or subpixel level clouds. You have to uh, have special techniques for that. It is very easy to detect, uh, you know, the thick clouds, the like threshold method or uh, channel ratio, very easy. But then when it comes to the other one, there's spatial coherence technique, there's time contrast technique, there are so many other techniques. So you should you should be aware that there are several techniques. We will not go into the techniques per se, but you should, I want you to convey only this message. Detection of cloud in a satellite is not very easy. It is easy when the cloud is optically thick. It is very difficult when the cloud is optically thin or subpixel level. You require special techniques and we have uh, that for that. Like this, for example, this is a thin, right side shows a thin cirrus clouds. The left side shows a subpixel level cloud. If, the, if this is the total area of the pixel, of a single pixel, the satellite will see it as a single dot. But actually there are a lot of gaps there. The, the, it is not fully cloudy. This is the problem, okay. Okay, now let us revisit what we already did. This is the thing which we, dot, we, we obtained from CloudSat and Calypso together, okay. You see this? So it's called the GeoProf LiDAR. Actually, both CloudSat and Calypso are combined together. This is the vertical distribution of clouds over the globe. Uh, and your liquid water path, ice water path, everything you could do, which were not done up to that time. Okay. So that is the beauty of this. And uh, let me also tell you one thing. If you use just only one technique, the top shows the cloud profiling radar alone. The top graph, x-axis is the latitude, y-axis is altitude. The top graph shows what is the vertical distribution of clouds, global mean, for one year, for December, if we use only cloud profiling radar. But if we combine these two, both LiDAR and radar, you see the picture becomes completely different. For example, service clouds that you're getting over the equatorial region, that green patch, 
earlier it is not there even the altitude at which the cloud occurrence peak in the top graph it peaks at around 12 km whereas when you keep the cirrus i mean the, the lidar also it peaks around 15 km because in the top graph cirrus is not detected okay so that is uh, that is the beauty of combining these two things um, this one i will skip for the time being it is okay uh, no sorry 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 I, I i will i will deal with this the this graph shows on the left side you have the northern hemisphere winter on the right side you have the northern summer northern summer means june july august september that is our summer monsoon season okay the top graph among these three shows high altitude the middle one middle level cloud and the low uh, level clouds below that and the bottom most shows what is the vertical velocity of the atmosphere at 500 hectopascal it is called a mid tropospheric vertical velocity why that is shown is this cloud occurrence and this vertical velocity is just one to one at most of the places let us come to the topmost graph which shows the vertical distribution i mean the clouds derived from the cloud sat and calypso that is real we are cutting through you see the largest amount of clouds occur as we have seen from the passive radiometer same thing you have largest amount occurring over the east equatorial indian ocean western pacific next patch uh, you have over the amazon region in the winter and over the african region next but if you look at the summer the picture changes you see it is not no more uh, at the east equatorial indian ocean western pacific but over the bay of bengal and if you vertically cross this which i will come to that in a moment which we did the world's large the, the topmost cloud which means the, the deepest cloud occur over this region july august september over the bay of bengal where the cloud top altitude is at least a kilometer more than that over any other parts in the globe this was proposed before image the data itself but it was confirmed by this okay and really dating okay now you come to the bottom most there is a significant difference between the top graph and the bottom graph in terms of low altitude cloud and high altitude cloud low altitude cloud you can see there are you know regions where high large amount of clouds the red patches are there for example of the uh, of the um, american coast south american coast or of the um, you know african coast that is in the atlantic and here is in the pacific or northern pacific or southern pacific this large amount of clouds occurring there off peru coast you can see this in the if you look at the third graph in the right side bottom that is low altitude clouds that is actually called the marine stratocumulus clouds they are huge optically thick clouds very shallow and they have a huge impact in the atmosphere they reduce the amount of radiation that is reaching the surface by as say as around 200 watt per meter square on a diurnal mean which is quite substantial and that causes cooling and a lot of dynamical things are there i told that because if you look at the graph in june july august over the indian region also such clouds occur not over the indian region big part of but indian monsoon region because indian monsoon occurs arises from around 35 degrees south that is called mascarian high mascarian high and in the mascarian high you have large amount of marine stratocumulus clouds they are very important components of the indian summer monsoon let us come to that in one minute now this is the radiative impact of clouds the top graph shows on a global mean what is the radiative impact of cloud so short verb short verb radiative impact is all blue blue means it is you know the color color bar is shown at the bottom it is blue means minus 50 to minus 100 that means effect is cooling you look at the middle curve middle graph that is for the long verb it is all red red is warming so it is of the order of 50 to 100 meters warming but the net effect if you sum up these two that is short verb will always cool long verb will always warm the net effect is the sum of these two it will be cooling at almost in no place it will have a warming effect okay because net amount of cirrus cloud effect will be annulled by the optically thick clouds okay it doesn't mean that cirrus amount cirrus is not warming cirrus do warm okay this is a global mean picture hmm? this is a study which we did you know uh, we know that sst sea surface temperature is one of the most important parameters for deriving you know um, for driving convection and there is a threshold temperature if you have somebody has taught you meteorology they will tell you that there is a threshold temperature above which convection will be triggered over the oceanic region and they will define it as around 26.5 degree uh, centigrade this graph shows y axis is the frequency of occurrence of clouds x axis is sst over the indian region indian ocean and the east equatorial indian ocean included and you can see the frequency of occurrence of cloud this is a classic figure actually this was also done at other parts of the world earlier so i am not claiming that this was done for the first time 
but this is an interesting study i will come to that in a moment this is done by one of my students meenu for her phd thesis you see with ss at low sst the cloudiness is very low but as the sst increases the cloudiness increases that means convection increases and people earlier put 26.5 as a threshold you can see that there's a distinct increase beyond 25 fine that's very good and especially the high altitude clouds that is the right side graph also you can see that but what is more important is after 29 degrees centigrade you see uh, it increases with sst and it reaches a maximum at around 28.5 to 29 degrees centigrade beyond which it decreases what is this sst increases but cloudiness decreases so higher the warming lesser the clouds what is happening this is actually hypothecated uh, hypothesized as a mechanism a iris effect i'm not going into the details at the end maybe we may be able to discuss this is a beautiful area of research even today there is enough scope for researching in these kind of things but let me tell you this graph as well as the earlier studies like this two studies were there were derived from the total amount of cloudiness the total cloudiness not for the vertical distribution of clouds the picture completely changes now this study is my uh, my another uh, my student who did his phd uh, in journal of climate is published earlier graph is for total clouds this is for the vertical cross section of clouds look at this x axis is sea surface temperature y axis is altitude and the image shows the amount of cloudiness you see this up to 27.5 actually you don't have convection okay you don't have convection the low amount low level clouds will be prevailing in 24 degree 25 degree 27 degree and all those things the real convection starts only after 25.5 27.5 degrees centigrade and that is what you are seeing in after 25 i mean 27.5 you know the blue and all those things and then you have large amount of cloudiness okay so you can see the red patch but then what people did earlier was wrong no what people did earlier was correct what they did is you sum up this vertically what they did is the total because they were not able to distinguish between at what altitude what type of cloud what you are seeing as you know as a as a as an intrusion towards the left at the higher altitude of 10 to 12 that i don't know if you are able to see my cursor this one is actually cirrus clouds that were uh, you know coming out from the deep convective regions and outflow okay so look at this you have a deep convective region you have outflow and outflow will take the cirrus to far off distances this far off distances when viewed from the uh, imaged data it will see that there is high altitude cloud or total amount of cloud is very high they will say that at 26 or, or something like that there will be huge amount of trigger which is wrong so this study has corrected what is the real trigger that occurs it is beyond 27.5 degrees centigrade okay now you come to the global three dimensional distribution of clouds see three dimensional distribution of clouds i cannot simply show in a single graph so what this is actually uh, i should i mean i should mention here this is a study carried out by another student is his uh, name is Uh, gupta ashok kumar gupta this is for uh, different regions for us i mean this is for winter season for different regions what the top i mean the right graph shows the major data okay so what is done here is we cut this sliced the longitudes into different sectors so 0 to 20 degree east 20 to 40 40 to 60 like that if you slice 80 to 100 is indian region okay 60 to 80 is arabian sea so this e that is this one that e is the indian region 80 to 100 degree east this is the vertical distribution of clouds and if you move to the pacific that is 100 uh, east equatorial indian ocean western pacific that is 100 120 120 140 140 160 you will find that large amount of clouds exist this is what you have seen in the image data earlier okay now if you see very carefully i will tell you something which is exploratory in nature which uh, we are uh, we have just communicated is you see a double band structure here this was known even earlier that is double itcc okay uh, you see 140 to 160 and 160 to 180 during winter season you have a double band structure straddled around the equatorial region you have two bands with very little amount of cloudiness in the begin in the middle this is called a double itcc first time actually double itcc was known even earlier we also have a study on you know minus uh, this is uh, we have dealt with the double itcc over the even over the indian ocean region but for the first time the vertical cuts of the double itcc could be done based on the cloud radar data which was not available earlier okay look at the uh, okay this one i will not go again much into the details uh, that's okay and now here comes the summer monsoon season the summer monsoon season i'm let us focus on the indian region you see this 60 to 80 80 to 
you just focus on the second panel from the top okay d e f you see the x axis latitude y axis altitude that red patch you see there is it is something like a wedge that is going up so that up means in this region that is around 20 degree you have the bay of bengal okay region 80 to 100 also you can see so 80 to 100 is the bay of bengal region you will see that the cloud occurrence there is peaking at a higher altitude that's why we are telling that the highest amount of clouds occur over the bay of bengal during the summer monsoon season when the clouds even cross tropopause at times of course very infrequently cirrus clouds especially that is the importance of indian summer monsoon the deepest amount of clouds occur over that region for the entire globe okay that means correspondingly there will be a lot of replications in terms of thermodynamics and other energetics and other processes that is what research is about okay uh, see that is what is shown there okay fine this i will not go much into the other seasons that is okay because this is very similar again i mean my student has crisp cross the whole globe for uh, the dimensional distribution of clouds another very interesting study is this graph shows the uh, distribution of the uh, number size distribution of the clouds x axis is cloud optical thickness y axis is the normalized probability of occurrence of cloud okay you can see that the clouds which thin and you see the y axis log scale huh? the occurrence of clouds with very thin clouds is very high and it exponentially decreases as the cloud thickness increases but here comes the beauty beyond 10 there is a secondary increase you see this in the red and in fact the tendency is seen even in the blue because remember scale is y i mean uh, the log scale this is a beautiful uh, aspect another thing this is actually associated with something which uh, we have carried out for you know anish uh, i mean ashok gupta's uh, thesis paper is published uh, in atmospheric research ready led driven convection so if you have a convection convective cloud deep convective cloud the top cloud will top of the cloud will further cool which will further instigate instability which in turn will be sucking in there to the top so if you can really push the cloud up to around 16 i mean bigger part around 9 km or 10 km it can go to 12 or 13 km through this process so this is the beauty of that a simple graph but then you have uh, this and that is what is shown in here uh, again i will not go into the details because our time is running out uh since uh, i am also interested in talking to you about the monsoon clouds i will not talk much about the monsoon monsoon clouds what the features that we have seen especially one or two uh, very interesting things are there you look at this you know the uh, monsoon means the region uh, you know because uh, when encompassed between the monsoon region is the region encompassed between the hccs in the uh, summer and the winter during the summer monsoon season this is the uh, i mean the upper curve winter you have the uh, lower curve uh, and large migration and uh, there are a lot of components uh, actually seven components semi permanent features you can clearly identify with the summer monsoon why i am telling this is because all these things are there in the cloudiness okay heat loop jacobat pakistan in northwest india mascarenas high at 35 degree south which is high pressure monsoon trough that is extending from the heat loop to the bay of bengal you know it all these things tibetan high that is uh, the uh, or the tibet you have the low level jet you have the tropical easterly jet stream and the equatorial trough there are all the semi permanent features of the summer month we will see all these things in the cloud nets and you have the weather systems lows depressions and off road vortex which we will not deal anyway because that is transient feature this is it you see this is a spatial distribution of clouds over the indian region this was uh, carried out by by my student meenu based on passive radiometric data you look at the summer monsoon season let us focus only on that okay that is uh, may we get part of june july august and okay september also you see there is large amount of cloudiness over uh, over the arabian sea of the peninsula the deepest convective cloud which we just discussed over bay of bengal so you have two red patches okay and in the near equatorial region you have another patch especially you can see in july august september that is actually the equatorial trough okay and the months the, the heat low northwest india you don't have much cloudiness which is well known because the heat low is very shallow and shallow can you cannot have a deep convection there okay because that is there's a strong inversion sitting above that okay so uh, the offshore vortex associated with that you have the large amount of cloudiness of, of the bay of, i mean of, of the arabian sea very deep convection 
uh, and then you can see the monsoon trough region you have large amount of cloudiness especially july august uh, time okay you will find that it is not exactly collocated with monsoon trough you should also know one more thing that monsoon trough has a north south tilt it is actually slightly tilted when you go to higher altitude slightly tilted and there's a corresponding thing which you can see in the in the in the uh, radar data okay but these are known these were known even without mean or rajin but you see another thing there is a small blue patch that is seen over the bay of bengal near the sri lankan region which is small which is quite small you look at august which is quite small a blue patch which people earlier attributed it as associated with the western cards the card effect but it is not card effect okay if you look at the deep convective cloud over that region it will be much more glaring okay you look at this is the deep convective cloud for the same period so you see july august september you have that blue patch coming up especially you can see the august patch type okay of sri lanka and though it may appear as a small patch so what is so great about it you take it from me its size is 1 million km square if you take the area it is 1 million km square but there's a beauty in that size okay this is the vertical distribution of clouds during the summer monsoon season that bottom four panels shows what is seen from the imager for june july august september what is shown in the right side is a vertical cuts that were derived from the calypso data by anish it is part of his thesis okay just wait for a minute you have the tropical easterly jet stream that transports the uh, you know the um, uh, the deep convective cloud outflow from the bay of bengal to the arabian sea that is what you are seeing by this that's why you will have large amount of high altitude clouds even over the arabian sea monsoon circulation at south of uh, you know especially over the arabian sea south arabian sea is shallow indian ocean and south arabian sea is shallow but notwithstanding that arabian sea you will find large amount of high altitude clouds mostly associated with the outflow from the tropical easterly jet stream so don't get confused by large amount of clouds there even high altitude clouds it is because easterly jet stream transports the cloud from the bay of bengal to this this is very important okay here comes what i told you earlier already there's a region where the cloudiness is very less and the outgoing longo radiation is very less this is a pool we called it as a pool of inhibited cloudiness means clouds cannot simply occur this is a, this is something which we coined pool of inhibited cloudiness okay what is happening over there look at this we could took a vertical cross section of cloudiness over the pool of inhibited cloudiness that showed the beauty you have a hole that is sitting a hole that is sitting over the bay of, i mean in a hole in the cloudiness you see the vertical distribution of clouds you have deep convection over the bay of bengal you have deep convection over the equatorial trough but over the sri lankan region you have a region where absolutely no clouds less than 10% cloudiness at lower altitude of the order of 8 km above that you have cirrus clouds so this was actually shielded so far from the passive radiometric observation so 40 years of passive radiometric observation did not reveal this okay now what you see the east west uh, cross section you have the north south cross section i'm what i'm telling is i put a cross square across the uh, pool of inverted cloudiness you see this beautiful completely uh, you know cloud free region so what so what anish did is he looked at the he wanted to uh, put the uh, you know patches together he looked at sea surface temperature he found that sea surface temperature is more than 28 degrees centigrade which is sufficient for convection to be initiated even based on our own study okay so that is not the one which causes this he looked at the surface wind divergence you see that red patch over of sri lanka it is actually surface wind is diverging whereas at the other part, surrounding region it is converging means here is diverging at the surface means it has to sink from the top cutting all these pieces together to uh, cut the story uh, straight we have proposed this uh, a mini circulation that is embedded within the monsoon circulation you have a deep convection over the bay of bengal you have a, uh, it, the air now uh, through the upper region want to go and sink at the south but while going it will be partly sinking over uh, the uh, bay of i mean yeah bay of bengal region and same in the north south and east west so you have the convection that is surrounding and this region will have a mini circulation embedded within that large scale circulation yes there is absolutely no problem but there is a mini circulation that is embedded within that how that circulation is driven what we did is we took these clouds and we found how much is the liquid water content how much is the latent heating that is liberated you can see this for different regions we did this 
and we the black curve shows what is the latent heating liberated over the uh, over the sri lankan region xx is the latent heating which is quite low and the other graphs shows over the other region surrounding regions which is very high so you have a region or bay of bengal north bay of bengal hugely convective large latent heating arabian sea large latent heating equatorial trough large heat, uh, latent heating monsoon trough large latent heating so surrounding these regions you have large latent heating this drives a mini circulation which was hitherto unknown so what i am trying to tell you is when you have the vertical cross section of clouds there are a lot of things which we think that we understand but we don't understand okay you can uh, you, you can you can find uh, those kind of things with uh, there are a lot of uh, such areas existing even now very very interesting aspects uh, that's okay um, i will not go much into the details again let me tell you uh, one more thing uh, the radiative impact of clouds over the monsoon region you know rajivan srinivasan rajivan is a secretary uh, moes okay he did a fundamental work on the cloud radiative forcing what is the radiative impact of clouds you know there was a paper by jeff keel which is one of the most classically referred paper on radiative forcing what is the radiative impact of clouds he proposed that the radiative forcing of short wave and long wave get equated over the deep convective areas over the equator this is a hypothesis based on his observations it is true for the globe but not true for the indian monsoon region that is what rajivan and srinivasan has shown in their journal of climate paper 2000 okay actually there is a net cooling short wave and uh, long wave there is a net cooling uh, you know net uh, negative negative forcing over the bay of bengal because of this deep convective cloud but they were not knowing that it is because of these kind of cloud structures okay so what i am trying to tell you is when you combine all these data together you get a different picture of the physics of the process this is what we did for the entire globe gupta's thesis 2000 my student uh, this is for the entire globe what we did from megatropics karab okay what is shown here is the cloud radiative forcing over the entire globe as a function of local time the top panel shows zero lt local time zero lt globally yeah? zero lt globally at any place local time not the universal time because you cannot have a universal time graph for this kind of radiative forcing because you have to combine it in local time okay so the top is for 03 lt 6 lt 9 lt 12 lt 15 lt 18 lt like that the beauty of this figure what does it show you have this is during the summer monsoon season it quantifies of course it confirms what they have already done uh, rajivan srinivasan but what is the beauty of this is it reveals for the first time the diurnal variation which rajivan srinivasan couldn't do because herbi data did not cover okay megatropics was the first satellite to cover the full diurnal evolution of uh, you know cloud radiative uh, clouds and radiative impact that's what we did okay what is uh, interesting here is you, you look at the longer radiative effect diurnal variation it changes from land to sea okay diurnally for example you look at central africa that is look at the 21 and 24 lt that is the bottom two panels you see that over africa 21 24 lt and then 03 lt you have deep convection and other times you have minimum and you, even over the ocean that is scenario that is of the order of nine o'clock over the entire globe you have minimum amount of cloudiness and minimum amount of cloudiness and hence longer cloud radiative forcing but over the open ocean you have maximum amount of cloudiness in the early morning if you clearly observe this graph early morning means 03 to 06 lt local time but over the uh, over the regions uh, you know like uh, africa 18 lt onwards they start building up okay that is not only over africa or any deep convective region over the land you have convection starting from 1800 lt or even slightly before and then you have the minimum coming up to around maybe 03 it doesn't come early in the morning okay so there is a distinct phase difference between the convection over the global ocean and land any part of the globe now you can actually actually this graph may look so uh, you know the greater globe is covered there are very minuscule features here including agat atagama uh, desert which i will show you in the right side okay you look at the short wave cloud radiative forcing short wave means earth reflect i mean you know reflected from the solar radiation you just look at off atagama atagama is a desert in the chile that is south america you can see this 80 degree 60 degree west you know around that you have a red patch that is what i was telling you earlier the marine stratocumulus clouds they don't produce long wave radiation so in the left graph you will not have that but they are highly reflecting low altitude clouds the long wave radiation forcing can be of the order of 200 300 watt per meter square in the known but just across that just a 100 km across that you have nothing zero so what does it mean 
at one place cloud will hugely cool at the other place cloud will not do that there's a huge differential heating which in turn drives the circulation over atacama i'm telling you a minuscule example you can have a larger picture from this you can have a smaller picture what is a smaller picture which i want to again tell you is you carefully look at the monsoon trough here india and the monsoon trough exactly following the monsoon trough you have a red patch that is what the cloud radiative forcing associated with the monsoon trough is and you have over the northwest bay of bengal you have deep convection and the amount of cloud radiative forcing is of the order of 300 watt per meter square again there okay you have the scenario for the uh, september october november picture is very interesting you have over the december completely distinct feature i want to again bring your attention to uh, you know the uh, uh, the um, amazon you look at the south america and look at the time for amazon and africa you know amazon and africa you, have, you can clearly see in the longer radiative forcing the maximum comes at around 1500 lt to 1800 lt over the land in contrast over the ocean all of them come early in the morning or late in the night okay short wave radiative forcing you don't have over the uh, night time because the sun is not there all right one of the remarkable features of this study is that ashok also did one more thing what he did is he took the uh, you know zonal mean radiative forcing zonal long bigger pattern longitude variation of the uh, equatorially averaged radiative forcing during el nino period and non el nino period very interesting obviously during el nino period you have the you know convection deep convection shifting from the sun i mean western pacific to the central pacific correct so obviously long wave forcing short wave forcing everything has to shift yes it is getting shifted uh, the blue curve and the red curve that they get shifted but the beauty of that is if you sum up that is the net cloud radiative forcing they don't change whether it is el nino or la nina okay what does it mean the effect that is produced by the short wave is annulled by the long wave at the deep convective areas that is the original proposal of jerky and this study for the first time showed that the net cloud radiative forcing doesn't change whether it is el nino or la nina but of course the long wave and short wave get shifted out okay the net effect of cloud is what this graph shows june july august september september i mean you know june july august september october november that is uh, top panel i mean bottom and the bottom most is march april may left panel shows net cloud radiative forcing during the day time middle panel shows the night time and the right panel shows day night difference what i want to show you here is during the day time it is all cooling because it is uh, you know mostly it is blue or light blue and there will be a little bit orange but that is actually area where cloudiness doesn't occur much okay it is so zero all right so it is cooling during the daytime clouds during the night time it is pakkar everywhere long wave trapping so there is a huge diurnal variation in cloud radiative forcing this drives actually the diurnal variation in surface temperature energetics dynamics and what not so i will uh, maybe i will stop here okay uh because our time is up i'm uh, very thankful to you for listening to me for last uh, probably one hour or maybe i might have taken another 10 minutes if you have any uh, questions comments you are welcome thank you very much yeah thank you very much sir so if you have any questions from participants uh, please raise and uh... shall i stop sharing or uh... yeah yeah you can stop sharing sir okay uh yeah yeah please if you have uh, any questions or concerns you can you can ask actually uh, don't worry about the uh, you 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 may think that you know what is uh, i may be asking some foolish question nothing like that no question is foolish each question has relevance okay a question is a question okay so you can i encourage you to ask no questions means 100% understood which is a very unlikely scenario Okay